afternoon, everyone. This is one more of my lecture here at the back. And uh, the topic of today is uh, a little bit uh, preposterous by the law. Can law be emancipatory? Well, actually, can law be emancipatory with a question mark? Is the title of the last chapter of the Order New Legal Common Sense. So I'm revisiting that chapter some years later and with some new insights, I think, and also some change of perspective, maybe. I think the first thing I'd like to share with you is this uh, paradoxical character of our time. Uh, on one side, you can see that there is an unconditional victory of law, of the rule of law, after the demise of a socialist revolutionary alternative. Until the 70s or 80s, one would see always the questions of the, the law and the, the rule of law in society as in conjunction and in contradistinction with the rule of revolution and the uh, role of socialism and communism or whatever. Well, it, it looks like that, uh, you know, the, the revolutionary agenda is for the time being congealed, suspended. Nobody knows. But in any case, it looks like an unconditional victory of the rule of law in our societies. So we are not trying to occupy the law. Law has occupied us. But the paradoxical nature of this is that on the other side, in my last lecture and in some of others, my texts, I'm claiming that we are entering a post-institutional era or age. It looks like and the Occupy movement, the Indignados movement, show that the institutions are there, but they don't function as they used to. At least this is the perception. And that's why the people take the streets and the squares in many countries throughout the world. And um, this shows that it looks like we are entering a post-institutional epoch. Well, it, law is the symbol of institutionality. That is to say, if we are entering a post-institutional uh, period, I jam, uh, there is no room for law. Because law is, par excellence, institutionality. The rule of law, of courts, of judicial system. So in a sense, it looks like everything is law, and uh, after all, nothing is law, in terms of the things that we can accomplish in our society. And I think that's what uh, you know, seduces me, to study the law from a critical sociological perspective at this point in time. Hence the title occupied law. Even assuming that this is an intractable contradiction in a sense. In a sense, maybe and maybe not, because there are may, many ways in which you can use the word occupy the law. For instance, occupied law could be occupy the law buildings. The movements could have decided to occupy the courts, for instance. The parliaments is a law building. The prisons, the police headquarters. This was an occupation. This would be an occupation of war. But they have not. They have occupied the streets and the squares. So this is not the sense in which occupied law is meant here. The second sense in which occupied law could also be alternatively possible is the role of revolutionary justice. In many revolutionary transitions in many states, uh, countries, we have gone through periods of popular justice or revolutionary justice. Less complacent eyes would see mob justice in it or mafia justice or multitude justice. But we have seen, even in my country, after the revolution of 1974, there, there were several trials, popular trials, revolutionary trials against landlords from the southern part of the country. And they were attended by lots of people, and there were lawyers arguing for and against, 
But they, they were not the normal courts. They were revolutionary courts. If you take other uh, countries, particular countries that went through a period of uh, uh, independence, a very contentious period of independence, like Angola and Mozambique, for instance, we had also periods of revolutionary justice and law. That is to say, nothing to do with the kinds of things uh, that I'm trying to, to address. So there's another sense in which you could say, occupy the law. Take the law to the streets, create popular courts, develop popular laws, revolutionary laws. This would be another sense. Well, this is not the sense in which I'm uh, using it here. Here I'm using it in a different sense. And the sense I'm using here, to, here is that the, the sense that even assuming that law is an hegemonic instrument, it may be used in counter-hegemonic ways. And you have to specify the terms in which these counter-hegemonic ways can be developed if at all, particularly at this period of time in which we are entering a post-institutional time. So is it possible to discuss these issues? In, in fact, the, 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 the uh, contact of people in the streets with law has been rather unhappy because they have been criminalized. They have been uh, taken to trial or taken to police headquarters. They have been criminalized. That's part of the criminalization of social protest. So it's not a nice way of occupying law. In fact, law is occupying them, trying to neutralize their struggle. So I'm going to try to develop uh, this other idea of occupying law as a, a way of using law, the legal system, in a counter hegemonic way. Is it possible or not? Well, as you can see, this is a, there is a debate in philosophy of law, which I'm not going to engage in. In fact, many people, if Peter Fitzpatrick would be here, or Costa Brusilis, <coughs> this would be a dialogue with them. Because they have been putting some uh, ideas about the impossibility of the counter-hegemonic use of law in the tradition of critical legal studies. Law is infamous, as Peter Fitzpatrick says. Uh, there is this original sin for others in law. Law is domination. And therefore, there is no use to resort to law as a kind of a counter hegemonic instrument. There are nuances, but in general, these authors position themselves within a tradition that we call the critical legal studies. I, against my will, was considered one of the founders of the critical legal studies because the work I did in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro. But I never felt very much in tune with the critical legal studies because I was very much concerned about the small victories that oppressed people, minorities, could have by resorting to court. They could get some resources out of that. They could uh, get housing. They could have uh, medication, treatment, by resorting to court. Is this emancipatory to begin with? Is this a progressive use of law? Or is just uh, law masking the indeterminacy of law always playing the game of the powerful? Always playing the game of the dominant classes? This has not been convincing to me uh, for empirical reasons and for normative reasons. For empirical reasons, because I have, uh, in my field work, so I'm not a philosopher of law, I have encountered many instances in which social movements have resorted to courts, sometimes with success, sometimes uh, without success, but they have gone through a period of internal transformation in order to resort, to be able to resort to courts, because many of them were very hostile in a sense uh, particular social movements with a strong Marxist influence, they would be re reluctant to go to courts, to use the legal system, because the legal system is part of bourgeois power, and therefore there is nothing positive to be expected from law. But out of necessity, out of reflection, out of ideological transformation, different cases in different countries and contexts, they have resorted to courts sometimes, they have pushed for changes in law, 
and sometimes they've been successful. So empirically, I cannot dismiss this experience. I cannot just consider it as a kind of, a, uh, you know, an anomaly of the system, because the system is supposed to work in favor of the powerful. But sometimes some good things are distributed to the masses so that they get distracted and they don't run against the law. That could be, but it's not convincing to me. But there's another normative uh, reason is that uh, all my work uh, was already in this area particularly was done the period of crisis of the socialist alternative, of the revolutionary alternative. And therefore, working with social movements, it is very clear that the social movements don't, very often, they don't choose their weapons, the instruments for the struggle. They use whatever instruments are there. They cannot choose. And I learned that from uh, my friends in Chile, when they were ousted by Pinochet. And we had very, very long, long discussions about that in Cuernavaca, at the center of Ivan Ilich. Uh, most of these uh, former ministers went to Cuernavaca. That's where I met them. And they were discussing why resorting to law, why the law, the legal strategy was a legal strategy for Allende. Even though Allende didn't have the majority in the parliament. And in fact, he was using some socialist laws, the laws that were passed during a, a very short period of socialist government, laws that were there, but they forgot to nullify them, to revoke them, and they were there. And uh, I had the people, very intelligent lawyers, like Eduardo Novo and Montreal, managed to come up with uh, interesting legal ideas. And they fought in the courts, and they were defeated because the Supreme Court in Chile was very conservative. But you see, we had very you know, long discussions. And that was the context in which I ran a seminar in 1974 with André Goss, a French sociologist, precisely the title was On Law and Revolution. So the idea at the time was that if revolution is failing us, what is the use of law? How can you resort to law? So this would be absolutely against what came to be the critical legal studies, because for the critical legal studies, law was basically ideology, bourgeois ideology. And therefore, there is no use of law for us to, to in a sense, promote any progressive cause. So, since this has not been very convincing to me, I tried to argue, and I'll be arguing here, the opposite argument, which is the idea that I'm neither with a position, a ma with a maximalist position of law as essentially bourgeois, that is to say the sense of essential is that it cannot in any possible way uh, work in favor of the oppressed in any possible circumstance. And I'm also against the position that law is a neutral instrument. That is the liberal position. Law is not neutral, it's partial. And partial in favor of the powerful. But power in our societies are power struggles, basically. And power struggles create contradictions. And within contradictions, there are rooms of maneuver. And they may be broader or, or, or narrower, but they are there. And there is no way, we are not at a time in which you can waste those possibilities, waiting for a better time. Because a better time is our time always, not a future time. And therefore, this position is the one that I'm trying to develop. And probably the reason why I stay in this uh, intermediate position, which is a different position from these two extreme positions, the liberal, and uh, the critical legal style, the Marxist, uh, anarchist vision, you know, it's, it's the, the, the political allegiance of critical legal studies are very, very confusing, to, to say the least. But this ambiguity starts from the very ambiguity of law. What is law? And I think many of our debates are about precisely what law is. For instance, is natural law law. So that's the, the very basic antinomy between the positive and the non-positive law. 
Is indigenous law law? Well, that's the other opposition duality between state and non-state law. Is Nazi law law? Is the opposition between legitimacy and legality. So there are many antinomies, dualities, oppositions in the conceptualization of law. And therefore, as I go along, I'll try to define or to convey to you what I mean by law, which is a much broader concept of, uh, of the positive law concept. But first of all, what do I mean by Occupy? Occupy is a collective movement to enter a familiar field in an unfamiliar way or to enter an unfamiliar field risking to commit illegalities with the purpose of pursuing some political goals. So that's my definition of Occupy. Occupy a street, of course, is Occupy a familiar field, but in an unfamiliar way. But we may be occupying banks, which are very unfamiliar, or courtrooms, or court buildings. But first, very different. So, my conception that I'm trying to develop is two moments. The first one is to see, in conjunction with my previous lectures, some of you have been uh, attending, is the development of the epistemologies of the South within the field of law. That is to say, uh, this is my epistemological quest to develop knowledges from the perspectives of those that have suffered the systematic injustices produced by capitalism, colonialism, and sexism. So that's my basic approach to that. So I'm going to approach law, law from this perspective, now trying to see whether law is really a hollow hope or on the contrary is something mean, meaningful for progressive causes of uh, social transformation. Well, the first uh, leg of my presentation is the following, is trying to conceptualize law in itself. A theoretical, sociological, theoretical analysis of law, and then to specify the dimensions of the counter hegemonic use of law. So there are two different moments. The first moment is, as you can see, if you were here for the citizenship lecture, is, is basically the same argument. That is to say, there is a huge, a very large, immense diverse experience of legalities and illegalities throughout the world, different conceptions of law, different conceptions of legal struggles, of legal life, and this diversity in the world is not accounted for by our liberal, Western-centric, or critical legal approaches to law. We tend to focus on state law, basically, and all our uh, concerns and analysis focus on state law. But this is not the only concept of law that we can imagine. There are many other life experiences of law throughout the world that are outside the state, are parallel to the state, are oppositional to the state, and may be recognized by the state or not recognized by the state. But they are there. This is basically the idea of legal pluralism, which has been one of the key uh, ideas in this understanding uh, of law. But this is not enough, in my view. There is more than we can do. So the approach that I'm trying to put forward is basically an approach destined to decolonize our legal conceptions and our legal understandings of Western-centric legality. Which are the main elements of this uh, decolonization of law, <clears throat> as I understand it? The first one is the idea of the visa line. So some of you have already are familiar with that, and I'm not going to dwell on that. 
is the idea that, in fact, modern law uh, has this uh, dual constitution of being one of the agents to produce the abyssal line that developed and divided metropolitan societies from colonial society. And whatever law is, is not on the other side. So if we produce rule of law on this side of the line in metropolitan societies, we produce rule of illegality on the other side of the line. So rule of law <coughs> goes together with the rule of illegality in our time. In our time, why? Because I think that colonialism is, has been part of my I work, I'm not going to develop it, I have developed it before, that colonialism is with us. And therefore, the colonial line, the colonial visa line, is part of our life in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, wherever. We have, of course, to understand that it operates in different ways, in different contexts, but this abyssal line creating invisibility, radical exclusion, abyssal uh, exclusions, they are still there, and law has been part of that. So I think that we have to see that law in its modern constitution, and here is state law basically what I'm addressing, because I use law in different conceptions for different purposes of my opinion. So I'm very, very instrumental in this case on the conceptualizations of the law. Because if law, the law that creates the Ibiza line is the law of the modern state. But the law that existed in the colonies, which is the indigenous law, the customary laws, they existed there. They are also law for me. But they are not abyssal laws. They are the ones that, in a sense, have been made invisible marginalized, excluded by the dominant state legality of the Ibiza line of modern times. So the first idea for us to understand the law is this character of the Ibiza line. Therefore, I think that whenever Peter Fitzpatrick and others think that this colonial origin of the law unifies a concept of law that is both valid and on this side of the line and on the other side of the line, they forget this duality, this contradiction, that is an internal contradiction within modern law. Is that law on this side of the line produces regulation and emancipation, is an argument, is an instrument of regulation and emancipation, on the other side of the line is an instrument of appropriation and violence. And it is both. It's no way of opting and say, well, law is just regulation and emancipation, the liberal. Or it's just appropriation and violence, the Marxist. It's both, in fact. Because it operates in different ways, and it operates to create this divide and to make it invisible. It's so abyssal that it's not visible. And that's why the theoreticians opt for one line or for the other side, or for the other one side. But they don't, they don't see both sides. And I think that the the core of the argument is this duality, which is not a contradiction, is in fact a suppression of a contradiction. So the first discussion in this, uh, in our in our lecture today, would be, what does it mean? This is a design. This dual constitution of modern law. The second one is that law. In our societies, and I mean again, state law, has to be understood as focusing on three kinds of civil societies. And you have that also in the argument of my paper, that I never use the concept of civil society, I use the concept of civil society with adjectives. I distinguish three kinds of civil societies in our capitalist society. The, the very intimate civil society, the strange civil society, and the uncivil civil society. So in fact, there is not a single concept in sociological terms of civil society. The intimate civil society is so close to the state that its expectations are fully secured about life. It may resort to law, but when law fails, resorts to impunity and to privilege. 
those that are in the intimate civil society in our society, they don't really need law. They, of course, have their rights. But they know that whenever rights are not available or for some reason are dysfunctional, they can resort to privileges. They can resort to impunity. They can resort to fraudulent manipulation <coughs> of national resources and so on, as it's happening today. I mean, there are this financial capital today, one could really imagine it as a kind of the most uh, exemplary <coughs> example of intimate civil society, in a sense, on a global scale. The strange civil society is the society of the vanishing middle classes in our societies. Those that have rights, but they are never certain whether the rights are being really to be respected. They may be violated. They resort to courts. Sometimes they are successful. Sometimes they are not successful. They may, access, may have access to medication and medical treatment in one case. In some other case, they cannot. So expectations, expectations are not as stable as the expectations of those that live in the intimacy of the intimate civil society. And finally, I usually use rings. You know, the, the inner ring is the intimate civil society. Then. A wider one is the strange civil society, and then the very large one is the uncivil civil society. The uncivil society are those that, in fact, even though they have formally rights, they cannot exert them. They cannot exercise their rights. They are objects of rights. They are not subjects of rights. Rights are very far away from their everyday life. Formally, they are citizens or non-citizens, it doesn't matter. But they cannot, in fact, exercise their rights. They are at the mercy of more powerful people or social groups. Throughout the world, the world there are many people that are under the veto power of more, more powerful social groups. These people live in what I call social or societal fascism. So, and as I said, we live in societies very often that are politically democratic but socially fascistic. So the people that live in the and civil civil society, in fact, they cannot resort to courts. Either they don't have means, they are very far away from the court system, very far away from the law. They may be, they have no resources, economic resources. They may be culturally very different, diverse in their lives from the culture that underlies the court system. So the reality of law as a kind of an instrument for uh, securing and stabilizing expectations is not there. That's why these people, the people living in the uncivil civil society, in a sense live in a situation of collapsing social expectations. In fact, as I said the other day, they are alive today, they don't know whether they will be alive tomorrow. They may be feeding their children today, but tomorrow, who knows? This is this instability that creates the horizon of rights as a kind of a myth for them. They are part of this uncivil civil society. So I think that if you want to decolonize more than law, we have to start from the uncivil civil society. Our liberal tradition, and even the Marxist tradition, focus on the two former civil societies. Marxism, in a sense, presupposes that everybody is, in a sense, in a intimate. The law is valuable for those that are in an intimate civil society. That's why law is bourgeois. Law is at the service of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie has at its disposal both the state and law, because there is no distinction between the two. For the liberals, Law is the realm of the strange civil society. Is the strange of the relatively stable expectations based on legality. But I think that most people in the world live in uncivil civil societies. They are object of rights. They are not subjects of rights. 
And therefore, I think that if you want to understand the kind of a counter hegemonic use of law, you have also to start from a counter hegemonic conception of law. And that law has to be placed on the perspective of uncivil civil society, which is not the normal referent for the theories of law as we know them. The third element of the decolonization of our legal approach, as I'm presenting here, is that we have to start from illegality and not from law. For those people that live in the strange, in the uncivil civil society, their encounters with law is not, they are not positive mobilizers of the law. They are very much repressed by law or abandoned by law. And therefore, they are victims of illegalities. Legalities that go together with impunity. So we have to focus more in our theories of law on how illegality is produced in society. Because there are different kinds of illegalities. The illegalities of the powerful and the illegalities of the powerless. And they are dealt with in very different ways by capitalist society. And again, here I'm in the state law field. Because the law of the, the illegalities of the powerful go very often without any punishment. You look at this country now, or Southern Europe now, what is really the obsession of the government? Is to identify the fraudulent claims of people that ask for social benefits, for social housing, for minimum incomes. And they are developing huge services. They are, in fact, hiring more people to control the frauds of these people that are asking for social benefit. What about the frauds of the people that are in the banks? In this... Uh, glass towers of our cities, much less, much less investment on that. So there's a lot of impunity. And this impunity is part of the legal landscape of our time. The law of the illegalities of the, the oppressed are dealt with, and we have, have to understand at two levels the illegality of the oppressed. The illegality is committed to the oppressed, and the illegality is committed by the oppressed. And again, these are different fields of study for us. Because more and more, people in the strange civil society and in the end civil, civil society are being criminalized by their social actions, by social protests. And therefore, they are becoming illegal in many ways, their actions. So they are bound to commit illegalities as they pursue their everyday life. And I'm not talking about stealing. I'm talking about any form of organization that may be controversial for the governing powers. That is to say, demonstration, marches, protests, and so on, as they exist today. They are being criminalized everywhere. But they do also make a bit, and these illegalities are very harshly punished throughout. We can see that also in Latin America these days why the anti-terrorist laws are being used against indigenous peoples with very heavy penalties. So it is a very <coughs> form, different form of a kind of a double standards in which the illegality of the powerful and the illegality of the oppressed are dealt with. So I think that in this regard, it is very important to Analyze how illegality is constructed in our societies. How things that are legal in one context become illegal in a different context. And vice versa. Because law as a given betrays law as becoming. Law as a given seems to be very stable, but it's changing all the time. But in our analysis, we tend to focus on law as a given. And we don't see that is changing all the time. 
and the, the re relations of production of these changes <laughs> are to the core of the understanding of a critical understanding of law in our times. That's why I think that illegality is not enough. We have to see the relations of production of illegality, so to say. Because they are these two different sub illegalities and they are dealt with in very different ways by our legal systems. The fourth line of analysis is for this uh, decolonizing conception of law is legal pluralism. And again here, is a very interesting topic because legal pluralism is a product of colonialism. In fact, it came into being as one of the main core debates in sociology of law out of the colonial uh, situation. Because legal pluralism addressed the question of indirect government, basically. The idea that indigenous, native legalities could operate within certain limits in the colonies. And then we moved from others, there are Sally Berry and others, myself, we have dealt with of what we call different phases or stages of legal pluralism until the most recent stages of transnational legal pluralism, as we call it. And in fact, when I studied the, the squat assessments in Brazil, it was the first moment in which we were, myself, Lauren Eider, and others, we had addressed the presence of legal pluralism in complex, as you used to say then, complex societies, <coughs> non-colonial societies, or independent <coughs> countries, or uh, semi-peripheral countries, as the case of Brazil, or others. It was the idea that, in fact, societies were pluralistic in legal terms, not just the colonial world. And that was the first, uh, developed the second stage of legal pluralism. And we have seen throughout that least legal pluralism has been developing more, and I have in other papers identified very different kinds of law that exist in our time, particularly how today in our societies part of the national law is transnational law. And therefore, we have a legal pluralism embedded in our constitutions. We have a legal pluralism embedded in our contracts, for instance. Contracts that have clauses that are consonant with our ordinary laws, but some that are not consistent with our constitution. Some of the clauses in international business contracts, for instance, they are legally pluralistic in themselves. A given transaction, a given contract. And this legal plurality is a kind of an internal legal pluralism. I call it interlegality. So it's a new phase, it's a new form of legal pluralism. And here, as you can see, I'm not resorting on the state anymore. I'm using non-state producers of law. And they may be on top or maybe at the bottom. They may be the multinational corporations or they may be the indigenous people. But they interact, in a sense, with the state law in different ways. What we see today, for instance, in the new constitutions of Latin America, in Ecuador and Bolivia are very good examples, and even Colombia, is the emergence of these constitutionally recognized forms of legal pluralism, in which indigenous law interacts in different ways with the state law, and the boundaries of this coexistence are set up by the constitutional courts. And the constitutional courts in Colombia, you know because Oscar is constitutional law professor here, of course I've taught you about this, is a very interesting intercultural constitutional law building that is now is becoming the model for the constitutional courts in Bolivia and in Ecuador. They are in fact using the constitutional courts decisions of Colombia as an embryo of an intercultural legality. This idea that indigenous laws can coexist with state laws. And we see the same in South Africa. And we see the same now in Mozambique, in which the constitution also allows for legal pluralism. So I think that the, it is very important to understand that legal pluralism is not a minor component of our legal world. The reason why we give so much weight to state law is because we tend to work with the state law in our professions as lawyers, as judges. But for most people, the most important understanding of laws is a legal pluralistic view. And their lives, in fact, are controlled as much by state law as by transnational law and by local law. And this transcalar conception of law 
is the other element of this uh, proposal that I'm uh, putting forward. Is this idea that the local and, and the global are in the same location today. We are territorializing legal relations in such a way that the community in the north of Mozambique now, just the community that I'm uh, working with and studying, that is a local people. And in this small community in which coal mining is going on, we have both Mozambican state law, we have the law of the transnational company, which is Valdo Rio Rosa, Brazilian multinational, and then we have the local laws of the community of the peasants. And the struggles going on in that community have the different scales of law at the same time. So, in order to understand sociologically speaking the rule of law for them, we have to understand this plurality of legal entities because they, the people have to move from one to the other almost every day. And when, for instance, social activists, leaders of social movements, want to enter or to come to those villages, and uh, they are prohibited. They cannot enter those, those areas. And who is forbidding them from entering? The state? No. The company. So you have, in a sense, forms of uh, the majestic companies that existed in the colonial period going on in our world today. Non-state actors, more powerful than even state actors for these communities, for instance. So I think that legal pluralism here has to be understood as a field in which the resources that people have to, the repression can come from all these scales. And probably the struggle against oppression is to articulate the different scales of legality. That's why they, reserve, they resort to elders. But then they resort to the friends of the earth, to bring in international attention to their struggle, to mobilize the international courts, to create visibility to their struggle. So they go from the local to the global in the same struggle. And the state in the middle, and this, everything is law, but they are different scales of law, and they are not, of course, congruent. One law goes in one direction, another goes in another direction. So this plurality of legal worlds is also an important understanding of the complexity of law as an instrument, as I'm trying to convey to you. So now the second part. The second part is then having this in mind, and this, of course, would, uh, would, would be developed in many different ways, but uh, it will suffice for the time being. What is the counter hegemonic use of law? What, what, what does it consist of? The examples that uh, I have in my work, they tend to be state law, sometimes local law, and sometimes transnational forms of law, inter international human rights, for instance. What are the conditions for a counter hegemonic use of law? That is to say, the use of law is a resource to diminish oppression, exclusion, or domination. This is the ground zero of emancipation. Everything that prevents people from dying, from going hungry, from being objects of arbitrary power, I consider emancipatory in our time. Because I think that we are entering a Charles Dickens style in one way or the other. And therefore, I think any protection of, of the bodies, of the human beings, I consider to be an emancipatory task in our time. Because I think that we are a time of destruction. Destruction of body destruction. That's why I turned to Schopenhauer. Why right? the body is the only metaphysics that comes at our time. And I have never seen society suffering. I've seen bodies suffering. All the other suffering is metaphorical. Only the bodily suffering is real, so to say, physical suffering, as I understand it at least. 
So, if you understand this basic premise, then the first condition for counter-hegemonic use of law is what we call structural opportunities. That is to say, they are never the same opportunities for an emancipatory use or counter-hegemonic use of law in all the circumstances. There are situations in the best progressive way of using law is to avoid it, is to run against it. I remember again that many people in the first years of the Pinochet regime where we were discussing these questions of law and access to law and what should the social movements do under the very difficult conditions of this dictatorship, very, very arbitrary and very violent. And I remember some people from the Communist Party telling me, oh, well, we better stay away of law. With these laws, we, we don't we have access to law. We don't want to have access to law. Because the law is so repressive that you have to fight against. There is no legal strategy possible. But in the end, this, this is not, was not the strategy that prevailed. In fact, people uh, continue to struggle. But I think that the structure of opportunities have to do, in many ways, with a minimally functional judicial system, for instance. If you have a corrupt system, a corrupt judicial system, there is no way of resorting to courts, for instance. So the structure of opportunities have to do with whatever organizational and institutional capacities you have in a given country. And here I distinguish between law as a given and law as becoming. Because law as a given is resort to courts. Law as become is produce legal change. It's to go to the parliament, it's to try to change law. Law as a given is to go to courts, but see if the courts are fully corrupt. Or if they don't exist, in fact. Or they are not minimally functional. I remember that not many years ago, when we used to discuss the corruption in the judicial system, was not the struggle of the judicial system against corruption, was the corruption of the judicial system in Latin America. So if you have a corrupt system, why resort to court? Either through law or through illegal means or whatever, they come up in favor of the powerful. There's no way in which we can develop a kind of an emancipatory use of law under those conditions. So you need a minimally functional uh, judicial system. And believe it or not, in many countries, most countries of the way, this is not given at this point in time. The legal systems are not there. The judicial systems are not there. They are not available. We have countries in which 90% of the lawyers are concentrated in the capital, where 3% of the population is located. So what, what is the meaning of the access to law and the rule of law in these circumstances? And we think that the rest of the country lives in alternative law. But what is alternative to? Alternative is the state Western-centric law because most people go by other legal ways, customary laws, peasant legalities, indigenous legalities. So I think the structure of opportunities has to be really dealt with carefully because different conditions call for different strategies. And I'm not sure that, in fact, the resort to courts is possible in many situations. So this may be one of the restrictions of the counter-hegemonic use of law. The other thing, the other condition for the counter-hegemonic use of law is that there is no legal mobilization without political mobilization. That is to say, the mobilization of law in a counter-hegemonic way should always be seen instrumentally as one tactic among others, as a legal strategy that may be combined with illegal strategies. For instance, the, the, land loss, the landless movement in Brazil is a good example for me of that, and I have mentioned that in other occasions. That is to say, on one side, they invade land or they occupy land in an illegal way. On the other side, they resort to court to defend their rights. They use the legal courts, the court system, but they never 
demobilize themselves by judicial actions. They keep the political mobilization intact and very often by resorting to illegal acts. Occupation of buildings, for instance, the buildings of the agrarian reform have been recurrently occupied by the landless movement. At the same time that they are fighting in court the right to the land that they are occupying because according to the constitution if the land is unproductive may be object of agrarian reform and therefore it is a legitimate target for the landless movement. But how do you prove unproductivity? Is one of the big contentious topics in land law in Brazil at this point is what, what we mean by unproductive land. But it's crucial for the landless movement to be able to sustain and legalize the occupations. And out of that develop the villages that are thousands of them in Brazil nowadays. Some of them already legalized, others not yet legalized. And I think that most of them are going to be illegalized in the future if the, if the, if the, uh, the, the current strategy in Brazil continues. So I think this articulation of the legal and the political is very crucial for this counter-hegemonic use of law as I'm trying to define as a kind of a desperate strategy in a time of life destruction as I see it. The third one is that you have to have institutional resources. A social movement has to be, and, and as you can see, for me, counter hegemonic use of law is never an individual mobilization of law. It's collective. I don't think that individuals as such can mobilize law. You know, I'm, I'm talking about individuals in the uncivil civil society. That's my perspective. As individuals, they are crowds of individuals. And they are unable to mobilize in a credible way the legal system. So they have to have some institutional resources. They have to be organized as movements, of course. And that's, this creates a challenge for the Occupy movement. Because the Occupy movement does, is more a system of aggregation than a system of networking. Social movements are networking strategies. The collective presences in the streets are aggregation logics, not networking logics. And for that, it is much more difficult to, to develop the, the institutional resources that allow for a result to court. That's why the indignados appeal to democracy, to the real democracy. They don't appeal to real law or law now. Why then? It makes sense to appeal to democracy now, but not rule of law now. Law is more foreign to a situation in which you don't have the institutional resources, not even the, the time to use this, this, uh, this instrument. So one aspect of the institutional resources for me is the use of committed lawyers. In my experience, they make the difference. They are what we used to call in the 60s in the United States the radical lawyers. Throughout Latin America now they are considered they name popular lawyers. They are lawyers, young lawyers that are committed to the social movements but have the technical expertise usually obtained outside law school because law school does not prepare them to really be good experts on behalf of the social movements. For instance, the questions of land, land issues, are not really dealt with in detail at law schools today. And that's the most basic struggle for these lawyers, is to be very knowledgeable about the laws concerning land rights. So they have special training, special schools of training. And what characterizes these popular lawyers is that they share the same objectives of the movements, and they obey to the strategies of the movement, even though there is a lot of consultation between them. That is to say, if you are entering an action uh, in court, a uh, court case, it is better not to occupy uh, a new uh, piece of land 
uh, one week before or two weeks before. Be careful there because the media is going to be against us and this may condition. Okay, so you have to really regulate, organize the strategy, both in legal and political terms, in such a way that they feel positive on each other. There is a positive feedback and not a negative disaggregation of the two. And this is very difficult because even young lawyers, even however committed they are to social movements, they have their technical demand. They can say, we can win this case. The, the judge is a, is a nice guy. We have these and these arguments in our favor. But the movement may say, well, but at this point it is very important that we do this, occupy this, or do this, or do that. Because otherwise we are going to lose credibility. So there is conflict of goals very often in the strategies. So it's not a very easy articulation, the legal and the political, in the mobilization of the of the social movements, the legal mobilization of social movements as I try to uh, <coughs> understand them. So, if you have these resources then, and in my work we have um, uh, one piece that I wrote, in fact, for American Bar Foundation, imagine, it's not uh, very progressive, but it's a, a very detailed analysis of the, the use of law by the landless movement. And you can see there the different strategies and different arguments. How the lawyers try not to apply ideology because they know if the ideology comes in in their technical analysis, they are finished because judges tend to be conservative. So they have to really produce ideologies as technicality. How do you convert ideological arguments into technical arguments? For instance, the justice of the, the injustice of land concentration in Brazil as a legal issue but the political issue, in a sense, is demobilizing. And therefore, and that's why the movements don't rely on lawyers, even on popular lawyers. They work with them, but they want to keep the political mobilization on top and legal mobilization subordinated to that. So you can see that what I'm looking after and, and trying to to make visible to you is, is what I call a sociology of emergencies. It's something that is very embryonic. It's something that is very fragile. There is nothing triumphalistic about that. Maybe reversible. Some movements we see, look at a, a book I wrote with Cesar Rodriguez, Garavito, Law and Globalization from Below. And you have an article there, by, a chapter by Raj Gopal, on the legal mobilization of courts in India on a mother river issue. Well, there are some cases in which the, the court decide in favor of the movement and following here against the movement. So it is really reversible. It is a very indeterminate type of field, but it's not a field in which it is better not to play. I think that even if it is a, the rules of game are not only indeterminate, but they are partial. We have to play it. We cannot afford not to play it. That's my position. Uh, looking at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the current situation of social movements as we are entering this second decade of the 21st century, there is a final point which I'd like to uh, uh, also mention, is love is becoming. That, that will be a topic for, for other lectures in the future, so I'm not going to uh, deal with it now in, uh, in, in detail. There was one that, was mentioned, that it was mentioned already last lecture, are the rights of nature. So there is to say these new entities that in my view are counter-hegemonic conceptions of legality, but love is becoming. There is new legal entities. They are not there. They are now in the Constitution, but they are not in reality. What is the role of that? The other one <coughs> is the transformative, what we call transformative constitutionalism. All these constitutional struggles from below that are, uh, in fact, uh, developing in some countries with lots, lots of, of problems and, and uh, difficulties. The other one is, is what we have been calling refoundation of the state. 
And again, as the refoundation of the state is a key concept for uh, countries like, uh, like Ecuador and Bolivia. Because they are refounding the modern state in a plurinational character. They are developing, for instance, constitutional local autonomies. That is to say, the indigenous people may develop their own autonomy with local constitutions, which in a sense sometimes have some elective affinities with the local constitutions of the peace communities in Colombia, San Jose de Apartado and others, that also developed local constitutions. We have in several countries now local constitutions. It's an, it's an innovation, a legal innovation. Appeal to the, the grammar of the constitution to produce an emancipatory struggle, an emancipatory narrative. Again, is the counter hegemonic use of constitutions. How far they go, nobody knows. I think that the cases that I'm analyzing, they're just two cases, uh, I tend to be skeptical at this point. That is to say, these innovations are being deconstitutionalized, actually, by the very governments that promulgate these constitutions. And why is that? Well, it's very complex to analyze this, but, but you can imagine how the inertia, the inertia of the legal theory of all the training of lawyers, even progressive lawyers, when they are confronted with these novelties, they tend to return to the old liberal traditional legal conceptions. And one by one, they undo what is promulgated in the Constitution. Because it goes against several things. Plurinationality, for instance, the idea that there is one civic nation, but there are several ethnic nations, and they can coexist. They can violate the principle of the equality before the law. And we have, you know, unending discussions on the ways in which plurinationality betrays the idea of the equality of law. The equality before the law. You can imagine the type of arguments using many of the liberal conceptions to destroy a post-liberal conception of the state which is consequent in this, uh, in this, uh, in this um, uh, new constitutions. The final point, it's uh, on law of, of as becoming, is some very interesting legal transformations that are taking place in Africa, in Latin America, and India, the ones I know, at least, of giving some legal protection to non-capitalist production. That is to say, to popular economies, to informal economies, to cooperatives. And these struggles seem to be very probably marginal to you, but they are very, very important. One of the most interesting struggles, legal struggles in Mumbai, is to legalize the informal merchants. The street vendors also. How can you give legal protection to them? How can you unionize workers in this area? And the debates around that are immense. But in a sense, they are a way in which these uncivil civil society people, they don't even count for the GDP, the informal economy, even though it's 70% of the economy. So these with these people, that these new forms are struggling. That is to say, in my conception, the, the struggles in Mumbai are trying to move people from the uncivil civil society to the strange civil society. This is the movement. The movement of people that are subjected to societal or social fascism, the arbitrariness of the police, for instance, are trying to protect them from that arbitrary type of rule, fascistic rule, and to enter a kind of some legal protection. So they are moving from the uncivil civil society to the strange civil society. These are the kinds of movements that, in my view, are accounting for this counter hegemonic use of law. So what I'm trying to get at, in a sense, is to expand the legal canon to try to this strategy of uh, the sociology of emergencies to bring 
some new ideas about the struggles, to expand the horizon of struggles, basically. But the litmus test of all these struggles and of all these legal mobilizations, for me, is always the same. Are there any changes in the aggregate power relations after the use of law or not? If there are some aggregate changes, that is to say, if the relations are less unequal than they were before, there's a gain. If there is no change in the aggregate power relations, the problem is useless. How can we fight if we don't know results? That's part of the deal. This is the risk society. This is not the whole respect of civil society. Risk society. This is the risk that the uncivil civil society in the world are running. Using hostile instruments because they are the ones available and try to make the best of them. And I don't think we can you know, diminish the value of these people and of these struggles. So, in conclusion, my answer would be, can law be emancipatory? No, law cannot be emancipatory. The social movements that struggle for law can make it emancipatory in that instance, in some instances. So they are the ones that struggle for that. Are we at a time in which these uh, struggles, emancipatory struggles, may be successful? I don't know, quite frankly. I think that, for instance, take the Occupy to show the, at the end the contradiction of what I'm saying. They used to say the limitations and contradiction of what I'm saying, actually. If the Occupy, the Occupy movement has a temporality of rupture, if you look at the sem semiotics, and uh, the performative nature of the indignados is always a kind of a suspended history in which there is no past, no future. There is a rupture, it's something novel, something that is a rupture where the previous constitutions, previous institutions, previous way of organizing things, even a new language. That's why it is anti-party, anti-party, and anti-politics very often. Right? Well, law is the opposite of this. Law is continuity, it's not rupture. So the temporality of the legal system is the temporality of continuity. Moreover, it's a slow temporality, a slow rhythm, which is very inconsistent with the temporalities of the movements as they organize themselves today. That's why I think that in some cases, they may be there, in some cases, they may be not there. And they are aware, and very much aware, of one limitation. That's why there is no romanticism about these struggles. Is that once you resort to legal, political mobilization, there are things that are off limits. Things that you are not going to discuss. Because if I'm going to courts, I accept the legal system as it is. So, I really lend some legitimacy to this system. By contesting it, in a sense, I cannot do that without legitimizing it in the end. So this is the contradiction. But the people, in fact, live in these contradictions. They, they don't supersede them in Hegelian terms. They live with them because their lives are contradictions, are living contradictions, bodily contradictions of hunger and food, of violence and peace, of conviviality and violence. Anarchic violence very often. As the kids, when they are in the bars in Sao Paulo, these days the probability of a young black kid of getting killed in a night in Sao Paulo is very high. Because 30 of them are being killed by night. And in Salvador Bahia is almost the same. And they tend to be black, in fact. This is the uncivil civil society. This is the ones that, in a sense, one could see that they are the most inept reference for a legal struggle because they are victims of social fascism every day. But does that mean that the movements now in Sao Paulo of some human rights movements are trying to protect these kids? are trying to bring cases against the police 
in a situation in which by night also three or four policemen are killed by them. So it's a kind of a civil war, it's a, a, the new urban civil wars. In a context of urban civil war, there's probably not much space for a country's monarch use of law. That's why I think that at this stage, political and legal mobilization have to go together, but political mobilization, of course, is priority of the legal mobilization. And maybe situations, or maybe we are coming to situations, in which the political mobilization will go with illegal strategies, not with legal strategies. And both probably are part of the same context in which we live today. Thank you.